Hello everyone, uh, good, evening. Uh, good evening, this is Dr. Khan, um, Executive Plastic Surgery. It's a pleasure to be on and um, I'm honored to be, um, be, be talking to uh, a lot of members who are coming on. Uh, welcome, a warm welcome to my new uh, members. Please share, discuss and talk uh, to each other as you will see this is where I share with you as an explant specialist my knowledge, my information that I have as a board certified uh, general surgeon and as a board certified plastic surgeon whose practice is exclusively devoted to explantation. Uh, I want to go ahead and share my knowledge and my um, expertise in regards to how I explant such that you can get the best out of this experience. The goal today is not for you to make a decision. The goal for you today is to listen, understand, comprehend, analyze, process, and then ultimately be able to apply this to yourself. What's very interesting, and I use the word amusing, lack of a better word, is the fact that if you were to go to 10 different plastic surgeons in order to explant, you would see without a doubt there's 10 different uh, ways that the surgeons will be explanting and this is where the knowledge comes into play uh, you know unfortunately in today's world and age the vast majority of the plastic surgeons look at explant surgery as basics as basically experimental that it is not being proven and that uh, breast implant illness is essentially is still a myth which is wrong you know, if uh, as you will see over the next hour or so, we will discuss what are facts that we know of, such that you can certainly apply those and understand and comprehend. And anything that I say um, is going to be hard evidence. This is not my words. I say this to everyone. Don't listen to me. Listen to uh, the information and the sources that I'm going to quote so that you yourself are well versed and I'm bringing forth what is hard evidence such that you can make reasonable, meaningful decisions in regards to how to explant. Now, um, having said this, my practice, as I mentioned earlier, is 99% devoted to explantation. This is essentially all what I do. I remove uh, saline implants and I remove silicone implants. I remove ruptured uh, silicone and saline implants. I removed residual capsules. And this is essentially what my practice is. For someone who has chosen electively to not augment, I've only put in one set of implants in order to basically uh, get board certified. I'm board certified by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. So having said this, um, I will go ahead and get started. The first and foremost thing here is let's go ahead and look at what the FDA has mentioned. So the FDA has said, and I want you to please fact check, make sure that you truly are able to confirm whatever I'm seeing. The first and foremost thing is the FDA has said, number one, that the implants are not meant to be in the body forever. They quote 10 to 15 years. From my experience, 7 to 10 years before they need to be replaced. They are not lifetime devices. The second thing the FDA has said is that implants are associated with breast implant associated anaplastic Larsa lymphoma and also associated with squamous cell cancer. That is had the patient not gotten the implants, that patient would not have gotten the lymphoma. And there is a direct, clear association between the implant and uh, between getting the lymphoma. And so this is a direct correlation. We know for a fact that the numbers are underreported. That's why the FDA has uh, basically put the alert out that not only the textured implants which were banned, but others, quote unquote, which means silicone and saline implants smooth. The, the non-textured ones are also associated with what is uh, breast, um, uh, the implant associated anaplastic larsa lymphoma and squamous cell cancers and the numbers are very much underreported. And the third thing that the FDA mentioned was the fact that there is truly an entity called the breast implant illness where there is a fatigue, brain fog, joint problems, rheumatological joint issues, uh, amongst the many others, and that there is, quote, complete resolution, close quotes, complete resolution once the implants are removed without any replacement. So this in itself, if you look at, is a very important alert because they're not being passive about it. They're telling you that they're not lifetime devices. 
they cause lymphoma, and that there is a resolution of breast implant illness symptoms. The second thing I want you to go ahead and see, if you go to my private breast implant illness support group page, you will see the manufacturers themselves, that is Mentor, Allergan, and Sientra, they will tell you that the risk factors include, as mentioned above, they list this as per FDA guidelines that they're supposed to uh, in their advertisement, but also that patients who are uh, basically being treated for breast cancer with radiation, chemo should not be getting uh, the implants. Patients who are going to be radiated should not be getting implants. Patients who have mental disorders that include depression and anxiety should wait for uh, resolution of their symptoms before they get implants. Now, you cannot control uh, when you're going to get depression again uh, or if you're on medications that you meet criteria for implants. Now, remember, this is, again, the mental problems that are associated with what is breast implant illness. They also mentioned that patients who have uh, connective tissue disorders like scleroderma or compromised immune system like diabetes, uh, uh, you know, should not be uh, getting implants. And you will see the many risk factors that the manufacturers themselves bring forth from infection, capsular contracture, malpositioning, uh, rupture of the implant, um, uh, along with uh, the need for replacement because they're not lifetime devices. Uh, as you will see, the other risk factors associated with implants are the fact that the self-monthly breast exam, how the women um, pick up on what is breast cancer, the number one most common cancer in women, where one out of eight or nine women are going to get breast cancer. The self-monthly breast exam because of the capsular contracture or because of the inability to palpate the entire breast tissue, now all of a sudden compromises that self-monthly breast exam and now breast cancer is being missed, or the many ladies, for example, who I've talked to who choose not to get a mammogram simply because they feel the hurt or they feel that that a mammogram might in itself potentially may cause what is rupture of the implant, and they feel that they were really harmed the year prior and they choose not to, and this is a big shame because, again, one out of eight or nine women are going to get breast cancer, and it is not genetic. A majority of breast cancer is spontaneous. And between the self-monthly breast exam and mammograms, millions of breast cancers have been picked up uh, prematurely and millions of lives have been saved as a direct result. Um, and along with the many other associated problems uh, that were this uh, basically mentioned above. So implants overall in general, as you can see, if you're listening and sitting on the fence, if she, you should get implants or not, implants are only associated with badness. And last but not least, if you listen to the many hundreds of thousands of ladies who are hurting with breast implant illness and their symptoms are resolving, uh, like the FDA mentioned, complete resolution, you will see there are there is a major movement of the ladies who are getting explanted. And as you will see, five years ago, there was not much of a discussion but if you look on social media and you look at the google search engines for example a lot of ladies are looking not only in the united states and canada but europe and the rest of the world unfortunately this is a topic that is not heavily discussed but this is where you know and again i'm going to quote my patients today i had a patient that left for california her husband told me that a top prominent rheumatologist in the los angeles area had basically turned down and said these were not the implants and she was having improvement of her many symptoms of breast implant illness. Unfortunately, no one wants to even hear the word breast implant illness. Um, and unfortunately, what I find in today's world and age, the majority of the plastic surgeons feel that there is more of a focus on the aesthetic lift, the fat grafting, and just cauterizing the capsule. And this is downplayed and that the importance of removing the capsule is downplayed. I have had many patients who have come to me not feeling better after having had their implants removed simply because the capsule was left behind. And only when the residual capsule was removed you see these patients in the masses who bounce back and become better and healthier simply because the silica toxic burden was removed and the patients feel better simply because the entire silicon burden was removed. 
So it is imperative, and this is the whole gist and heart of the explant um, experience for the patient, and certainly the commitment by the surgeon that the entire capsule must be physically removed. And as you will see, the videos and the pictures I've put forth on YouTube and also on social media, specifically the private breast implant illness support group page on Facebook, where I physically remove the fascia of the intercostal fascia along with the serratus anterior, pectoralis minor, and also the periosteum and perichondrium such that the entire implant and capsule is removed as one system without any of that capsule remaining behind. In order to just cauterize, it's not good enough because you leave the remnants of the silica behind and that in itself is enough to continue to hurt and burden the patient. And the many signs symptoms of breast implant illness linger on and continue. The patient may find they're 50-70% better but not a whole lot. And the patients know uh, that there is some more of that quote, poison remaining behind because they continue to hurt in the similar manner because there was a in complete attempt by the surgeon. The surgeon must write down on the consent form and it's the medical legal bind that the patient and the surgeon has and the patient should feel comfortable talking to their surgeon and getting that wholehearted commitment and feel that that whole capsule must be removed. You should actually tell your surgeon, I don't want you to remove the capsule and he will say, well, no, you have to, that's your surgeon. That's where you need to go. You should not say, well, okay, if you don't want to, I won't remove it. It's not necessary. Or if your surgeon says that your capsules were, if they're too thin, I'm not going to remove. No, no matter how thin the capsules are, they must absolutely be removed because that is the whole essence of explant surgery. One cannot tell by looking at the capsule in the operating room. The surgeon cannot and say, well, this is healthy, this is bad. Only when the pathologist looks at it under the microscope will then... The, uh, we'll be able to conclude definitively that this was the badness that was left behind. And most importantly, the patient should have the peace of mind that the surgeon removed the whole capsule. And that is the whole heart and gist. You don't want to find out after the fact that the silicon spilled into the chest because the surgeon thought these were near implants or he did not feel comfortable doing an end block removing the capsule off of the rib, which is indeed what is the hardest part of the whole operation. And that is truly the taxing part of the surgery. And this is where the surgeon should take his or her time to removing the whole capsule and post up when the patient rests and recovers and puts her head on the pillow after her surgery, she should have that peace of mind that the surgeon removed the whole capsule because if that is not present, then that question mark remains and the unfortunate anxiety slash uh, incomplete recovery will inevitably occur and you do not want to be in that situation. Uh, so the whole commitment here is to removing the whole capsule to be able to with confidence say that the patient now has the best chance to bounce back to a normal state of good health. Now from my experience of having done many of these over a thousand of these explants and remember, this is essentially all what I do. I have done them repeatedly in the manner where, number one, I don't necessarily do a lift. There is no lift that's required in almost 80% of the patients. Number two, there is no drain placement. The last time I used drains was well over three and a half years ago. Even in the many ruptured silicon cases that I've done the many Facebook Lives on. And number three, twilight sedation or anesthesia. Number four, the implants are always returned to the patient. Uh, and number five, the capsule is always sent to pathology to rule out the BIAL, CL, CD30 analysis, rule out lymphoma. Number six, cultures are done for aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal. Number seven, I take high definition pictures and videos of the chest wall showing complete removal uh, of the entire capsule and implant and that there is good, healthy, viable tissue remaining behind. And number eight, last but not least, you are able to basically uh, uh, get the same surgery regardless of the age. I operated on a 75-year-old lady, for example, and a 22-year-old. They get the same surgeries regardless of the comorbidities and uh, the problems that the patient present with. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start answering some of the questions as they do come in. Please feel free to ask any question. This is your chance where I just had like a brief introduction. I will mention 
what qualities or what are the ways with confidence that you can state that your surgeon did the right surgery so that you have the peace of mind. And let me go ahead and say this and then I will answer the questions because this is probably the most important. You have to feel comfortable. Today, uh, early in the morning or last night, uh, I talked to a lady like around 11.30 p.m. and this was Hawaii time. She had done research on me. She felt comfortable uh, and she knew a lot about me from the Facebook. This is what you're looking at where you have done your homework and now you're talking to me and I will make it very specific to the patient where number one, the length of the incision needs to be approximately the diameter of the implant. If you have a 300 cc implant, you can imagine the size of the incision. You cannot remove that implant, be it saline or silicone, from a one or two centimeter incision. If someone has a 800 cc implant, you have to have a relatively bigger incision. Number two, the length of time. You cannot do the surgery in an hour, hour and a half. On average, this is again exclusively all what I do, I take four hours. A good two thirds of the time I run over uh, the four hours that I allocate for my explants. The cancer patients, sometimes I do five hours and I do those on a Wednesday when I do those two cases. I do operate primarily on a Tuesday, three cases, two cases on a Wednesday, and possibly two or three cases on a Thursday. So the length of time, the length of the incision is approximately the diameter of the implant. The time of commitment is approximately four hours in a manner where the surgery is done very pristinely, very nicely, where vast majority of the times my blood loss is approximately five cc's or less when well over 99% of my patients. The third thing is the implants are always returned to the patient. Sometimes the implants are ruptured, uh, where the saline implants is ruptured by some surgeons, which is wrong and bad. You don't want to leak those internal contents be inside the implant or in between the implant and the capsule. God forbid there is any white paint as you have seen or any fluid or any uh, abscess which we have seen. I do not want that to leak out. So the end walk is the gold standard. Um, and uh, complete 100% removal is the goal uh, for uh, removal. So again, in summary, the incision needs to be the length, uh, length of the incision is approximately the diameter of the implant. Number two, the length of the surgery in itself uh, needs to be approximately four hours. And number three, uh, where you have the, the entire uh, implant be returned to the patient so that he or she knows that this was not injured or traumatized. Number four, you want to see high definition pictures of the chest wall showing complete removal of the whole capsule and that cutting open of the... Sorry about that. Uh, my phone just literally bounced off this. So number four, you want to see that uh, the... Uh, high definition pictures are basically done such that the entire chest wall ribs are seen and that the fascia of the serratus and uh, the entire removal of the, imp the capsule and implant was done and that there is no capsule remaining behind and then cutting open of the capsule is also done showing removal of the capsule definitively. Number five, this is Kind of summarizes the whole th uh, deal, if you will. The surgeon must be very vocal and enthusiastic about talking about breast implant illness, not being timid or shy about vocalizing because he does not want to scare off the potential patients who are going to get augmented. Imagine if I were augmenting, all what I have said goes down the drain because you cannot be doing both. If your surgeon is putting an implant, he truly cannot be committing to a proper explantation. And unfortunately, I find the vast majority of the surgeons want to have it both ways, where they're being politically correct. Of course, breast implant illness exists. And the next thing you know, they're putting in five, six implants in a day. And it's, I will tell you, any surgeon, number one, should not be putting in implants. That in itself reassures you with confidence that your board certified plastic surgeon is doing the right thing. And by board certification, I mean that if you look at this logo right here, right? Uh, this is where you have the round logo, a member ASPS, American Society of Plastic Surgeons, this logo right here. You wanna see your surgeon has this logo. This commits to you that your surgeon is gonna do the right job, a right train, and 
it will be absolutely professional. There are going to be many plastic surgeons who unfortunately want to jump in and say, hey, why not? I can definitely do some more of these patients to get some additional supplemental income. And unfortunately, the whole fixation by the surgeon is to be politically correct in order to be more fixated in doing a lift and fat grafting. Fat grafting, if you ask me, and I say this and I've said this many times, unfortunately, I consider it malpractice. One out of eight or nine women are going to get breast cancer. And as you will see, fat, 30 to 50% of the fat inevitably is going to die because it's not going to get its blood supply that it needs in the chest, in any chest, be it young or old. And uh, the when the fat dies, some of it is going to get absorbed. Some of it is going to form dead clumps of fat. And when you do your self-monthly breast exam, you're not going to be able to conclude if this is your original native breast tissue versus a mass versus a benign mass versus breast cancer. And unnecessary biopsies will be done. And I will tell you, no one will be able to tell definitively till a biopsy is done. Now, sometimes an MRI can be done or a mammogram or ultrasound, but you don't want to be doing these repeatedly. And unfortunately, it does disturb the nerve slash uh, the, the, the overall aesthetic feel. It's not your natural breast tissue anymore. Certainly, it will give some volume. And I'll tell you, if 150 cc's is injected and let's say 80 cc's, uh, basic 70 cc's dies, then you're only left with 80. And 80 cc's is not going to do much unless you do serial fat graftings and you don't want to be running into a problem where you're feeling these irregular nodularities, which inevitably will happen. And now unnecessary anxiety if it's cancer or MRIs are being done for the name of aesthetics. And it's okay to do the face where 30% of the fat is going to die, where you have the best blood supply and the injections are maybe 10, 15 cc's. And if 30%, you will have permanent volume. So it makes sense on the face where a small amount using the Coleman technique is done. But to the breast tissue, I would say absolutely not. In those patients who have cosmetic enhancement under fat grafting, what I would call is a big no-no. Absolute not. So uh, now remember, unfortunately, the vast majority of the plastic surgeons are fixated in the aesthetics they're doing quote, sometimes even insurance-based explantation, which is a big no. I will tell you the reimbursement uh, for explantation uh, where you're just removing the implant is minimal to none and no insurance company is going to justify removing of the capsule plus the implant. Let's see, even if it's ruptured or there is a grade four contracture, which they like to cover, majority of the times they will say, well, you put them in for cosmetic reasons and if you're removing them, uh, you should cover them. If I get a facelift that goes bad and I go to the emergency room, they're going to say, who told you to get a facelift? And anything that basically occurs as a result of that, you're going to cover. So how many times do I see, unfortunately, the many patients that get their surgeries done in Mexico where they got a breast lift and an augmentation and a tummy tuck and a thigh lift, and now 12-hour surgery, you're running into wound breakdown and problems. They go to the emergency room and the insurance says, well, we're not going to cover any of that because that was done for cosmetic reasons. And the bottom line here is your focus should be complete on removal of the implant capsule and all inflamed tissue. And I will tell you from my experience, there is no indication or reason to be doing what is an unnecessary lift which only puts a lot of scars sometimes on the many patients who do not need a lift. Now, I would love to do a lift on everyone, but majority of the times, 80%, I will tell you very humbly, there is no need for an unnecessary lift that is very traumatic and very hurtful to the patient where the nerves and ducts of the breast tissue are unfortunately uh, cut and a scar that basically stays uh, on the... Uh, center of the chest post-op that was totally unnecessary and as you will see the many patients who are very happy even in their 30s 40s 50s and even in the 60s now sometimes I'm not able to I'm not able to tell the patient in pre-op even if I were to examine them that they will need a lift or not sometimes I'm able to say that with good confidence on the operating room once the implant is out and I have cut as you will see the excess skin on the side that really allows for what would be a pseudo lift and enhancement and 
what would be a very pleasing horizontal scar, horizontal scar that's going to hide right in the crease. I find the vast majority of the surgeons, unfortunately, are doing an incision from the nipple areola down because they're more fixated in what is a lift, and that is a scar right in the center cutting around the nipple areola for a scar that is not required. As you will see, some surgeons have even said that it allows for them when they do this vertical incision to be able to see and operate without having to operate with a neck that is bent in order to operate from a horizontal incision. You cannot remove the capsule off of the rib by doing a vertical incision. It is virtually impossible for me to do that. And in order to be able to remove the capsule all the way from the medial inner side to the outer side, the surgeon has to be able to do what is a horizontal incision such that all the dissection is done underneath the breast tissue without touching the breast tissue unnecessarily. And unfortunately, I find that some of the surgeons, a good number of the surgeons, if you will, are doing the surgery in three hours, where just the lift alone takes uh, three hours to do. And the explant in itself, for me, uh, you know, takes the four hours. So that is, again, a very important point for me to mention. Now, please ask me all the questions that you can, and I'll be more than happy to answer, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, now, plastic surgeons are not using these devices according to the manufacturer recommendations. How can we hold them accountable, report them to the state medical boards? Now, I will tell you, you know, the plastic surgeon has to discuss the pros versus the cons of what they have clearly mentioned uh, on the black box warning, right? Uh, now, the patients, unfortunately, need to do their homework. Uh, you know, in 1992, the implants were banned. They were banned. Why? Because the FDA stepped up and said, we're going to ban silicon implants. The plastic surgeons did not step up and said, oh, we're going to ban implants because we feel that the risks are more than the benefit. No. Unfortunately, the next time around, the FDA and administrative society uh, will only step up and uh, right now they're being politically correct and trying to keep everyone happy very passively. They need to step up and say, well, look at all the bad detrimental effects of breast implant illness that I mentioned earlier. If they just listen, any reasonable person with any reasonable thought process listens to what I just said, they would not even think twice about getting implants, not even once. Because why harm your body? If a young 20-year-old lady wants to go and a 21-year-old lady wants to get silicon implants, in her lifetime, she will have them changed at least if the average American lives to 82. You will see she's going to at least have them changed six times less alone all the other problems that are going to come. And if you listen to the manufacturers, they themselves tell you, if you get a silicon implant, you need to get a MRI at year three and then every two years they're onward. So I will tell you, no plastic surgeon is going to step up and say, you know what, we are going to ban. If anything, you look at the leadership of the societies. They mentioned that breast implant illness is a myth and that plastic surgeons have studied breast implants more than any other device and they've been deemed safe and harmless to the point where there actually is another plastic surgeon uh, who actually uh, is saying that uh, you know, uh, implants are safe, uh, breast implants are safe, which is wrong, uh, that breast implants uh, decrease or do not cause breast cancer, which is wrong. I mean, and again, this is again being politically correct and how no one is going to hold that surgeon accountable. All what I mentioned, this is not my opinion, the FDA warning, the, 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 the manufacturer's warning, uh, and number three, the Patients themselves in the masses who are speaking, right? You're hearing them uh, talk about the illness of breast implant illness and the many detrimental causes. And you will see these ladies in the hundreds of thousands. Look at the 350,000 complaints against uh, the implants that were made to the FDA and they were passively overlooked. This is a big deal. And look, they're not even holding the FDA accountable. Technically, they should be. The FDA should be held accountable. There was 350,000 complaints against them. And I'm not, I'm just saying as like a neutral person, if someone's complaining and there is badness that's a direct result of the implants, if someone is not doing anything about it, that 
body that's responsible for governing and implementing and making sure that the devices are safe, they should be questioned and they should be held accountable too um, as to why this is happening. And I'll tell you this, I talked to Dr. Corneliuson. She is the assistant director of the FDA who is responsible for the devices. She is directly involved and working closely with Dr. Bashar, uh, Neil Bashar. And she's responsible. And I said, you know, you're fixated on the squamous cell cancer, 16 cases that have been reported. Are you overlooking the literally hundreds and thousands of adverse events uh, that the ladies are complaining and you should step up? And uh, if I were you, I'd probably listen to them uh, as well, if not more, compared to the 16 cases. Obviously, those 16 cases are very important to report and for the plastic surgeons to send the capsules off. And this is also very wrong that the plastic surgeons are not sending the capsules off even if they're suspicious and the patients themselves unfortunately are living with lymphomas that are being missed because no one is fixated in sending the capsules off to pathology and doing the CD30 analysis and specifically telling the pathologist to rule out the BILCL because that is, if it's not checked, it's going to be missed. Uh, the... Now, I say this to you very assertively, very definitively, and there is nothing wrong or ill will. I'm just, as a professional board-certified plastic surgeon, I'm speaking my mind, and I'm transla translating to, you know, look at a ban that has occurred. That was not a joke. They should have banned saline implants back then, as well as much as they did the silicone. And when they were reintroduced in 2007 into the market, that is the silicone implants, that is the gummy bear safer, you will see there was no experimental studies that were done and follow through and they were uh, just accepted as the gummy bear safe implants, which they absolutely are not. So the next question is, uh, I have a medical bill for over 200000 for my 28 uh, hospital stay due to liver cirrhosis, which I believe is due to. Now, um, this is something that uh, you know, it's unfortunate and my heart goes out to you. Nowadays, it doesn't uh, uh, take much. And obviously, uh, remember, this is a fact. Breast implant illness affects every single organ system of the body. Some more, some less. Uh, now, the next question is, uh, please ask any questions and I'll be more than happy to answer. So as I read, I'm just looking at some of these uh, questions that are surfacing. Let me go ahead and look at my other phone so I can uh, read. Um, now, um, so liver cirrhosis correlation or cognitive studies. Now I will tell you, you have to go to a hepatologist as a plastic surgeon. This is way over my head. I'm not a hepatologist or a gastroenterologist who deals with liver issues. Liver cirrhosis is a serious life-threatening situation. Uh, you want to find out and you get this worked up. It is hard for me. I will tell you from my experience, I've seen a lot of patients. Majority of the patients do not come in with liver cirrhosis, for example. So there might be an underlying ideology. Uh, now, the mesh itself that you see, there are many different types of mesh. Uh, there is polypropylene mesh for hernias primarily. There is stratus pig mesh. There is alloderm cadaveric skin mesh. There are many different types of meshes that are used. And so basically, uh, you have to uh, look at these individually. We are talking about today is what is silicone breast implant illness, be it from saline implants or silicone implants. And the same wrath that the silicone implants cause, saline implants cause. And one is not able to differentiate between the two type of implants and the problems that the patients come in with. Uh, now, just one second as I read over here. Uh, Just one second as I scroll down. Uh, 
I have uh, next question is uh, I had uh, explant and fat transfer and lift. Remember, fat transfer, as I mentioned, is not a good thing at all. And I would I've said it; it's what I would consider it as malpractice, and that is a very uh, reasonable term or uh, a way to describe it from my experience. Uh, how can we as our own advocate ensure surgeons follow your guidelines? Now, I will tell you, I didn't make any of this up. I'm just basically putting the two and two together. And from what I've seen and heard, no one taught me that the whole capsule needs to be removed. This is me looking at the pathology reports and seeing the many sign symptoms and problems that uh, capsules cause, for example. And as you will see, just go to my private breast implant analyst support group and look at the many pathology reports and they will tell you giant cell reaction, histiocytic reaction, silica, uh, foreign body reaction, and you will see the chronic inflammation that's listed. And most importantly, when you see the patients, when their entire capsule is removed after a residual capsulectomy is done, you will see the many patients bounce back to a normal state of good health. And so the surgeons should, remember, we're trying to rule out lymphoma, we're trying to remove the capsule, and certainly in good trained hands, uh, it is a very reasonable, well-tolerated operation. In well over two-thirds of my patients, they require uh, Tylenol and or Aleve if they can tolerate, Tramadol, uh, and then also depending on their pain requirement for threshold pain, Norco and Percocet. Major majority of my patients, two-thirds or so, they're done by day two or three where they don't require much of pain medications. Now, every patient being different, and this is basically, as you will see from the many ladies, this has been what their experience has been. I state to the many other surgeons and doctors, and again, I have nothing to gain except for the patient's own good. The drains, for example, are not required. You see surgeons doing a lift 100% of the time and a drain 100% of the time, and I say this with all humbleness. It is not my ego. I just want to state that I have in my practice well over a thousand patients that I've done and I've used drains in only seven patients. Uh, and this is the paper that, uh, this is my uh, 1,000 explants that I presented at the Icoplast World Congress in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, uh, earlier this month, uh, May 3, uh, May 4 uh, is when the conference was. And I've shown that, you know, the drains are not required. Unfortunately, I find the drains are required in those circumstances where there is cutting of the muscle up and down rather than... Uh, horizontal or incomplete removal of the capsule is done where the residual capsule now becomes an inflammatory burden and weeps or their dissection is not done in a nice avascular plane where now there is oozing of the tissues because there was a rush into doing what is an explantation and I find now the drain becomes mandatory. Also in the vast majority of the cases where there's spillage of the silicone into the chest, unfortunately, now that commitment by the surgeon of placing drains is done because that silicone, no matter, no matter how one, uh, how the surgeon washes that off from the chest, that caustic effect of the silicone on the chest wall itself will induce the irritation and the fluid buildup, and now the drain becomes mandatory. So another way to gauge the expertise of your surgeon is say, how many times have you done this without a drain? Because if there is no drain, then you can say with confidence that there was no spillage. Because the moment the silicone spills in the chest, the surgeon is obligated in putting in the drain. Now this is another way to gauge and see how well your surgeon is doing it. And you will see across the country, I see some of the surgeons are doing explants completely, definitively in the time allocated without a lift and without drains because it was done right. And so look, the patient from today, the California patients, the her rheumatologist said there is no such thing as an explantation and removal of an implant and that will get you better. Remember, this is a rheumatological problem, right? So most of the patients have gone to a seen a rheumatologist or an allergy immunologist and Majority of them downplay what is breast implant illness. Now, I will say this to you very humbly. What do I know about pediatrics? I'll say zero. What do I know about cardiology? Zero. What do I know about rheumatology? Zero. I will tell you, I'm not going to weigh in 
and talk about something that I do not know of or I practice or I have not been trained or I have not given an exam for. Likewise, I wouldn't rely on a rheumatologist to weigh in and tell me if the implants are good or bad. And you would see they have not even touched an implant. Maybe they did during their surgery rotation in medical school, right? They have not been actively involved uh, with dealing with implants. If anything, they should go back and look at the literature in 1992 and see why those silicon implants were banned. And they're banned for exactly the same reason that that older technology, the silicon was leaching into the periphery and they were rupturing. Guess what? The gummy bear implants in a likewise fashion are biodegrading from day one. And I agree with Dr. Henry Dykeman. They're hurting. And after a certain period of time, they start disintegrating, breaking down. And that silicon starts leaching, even with saline implants, to the point where now the burden threshold is reached and the patients now experience a lot more symptoms of what is breast implant illness. So there is no such thing as safe implants the newer generation. Now, I will tell you, I've heard this question before, uh, you know, can you find a way to donate our bodies for BI research? Unfortunately, in the United States with the ERB and the very strict ethics laws, rules, you know, this cannot be done very safely. It only can be done at a major reputable big medical center such as the MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering or any of these big uh uh, you know, uh, hospital systems uh, where they can do research um, uh, and determine from the tissue via electron microscopy and energy dispersive x-rays where the silica has gone. And I'll tell you, the manufacturers themselves, believe it or not, have the data, they have the knowledge given the previous 92 ban where and how uh, basically the implants cause the detrimental effects. And you will see just here, look at the uh, the, the biopsies that have been done. You will see from Dr. Atul Mehta, he did the lung biopsy in a patient with intact saline implant and he concluded in his paper that he published with the UT Southwestern team, the pathology team, that the silica came from the silica of the saline implant shell that is silicon that leached into the blood and made it to the lung because that is via electron microscopy and energy dispersive x-rays how that silica made it. It was not from the toothpaste or it was not from anywhere else. And we know from the Dr. Henry Dykeman that the silica did deposit in the uh, spleen, for example, or the tissue around the nerve. We know from my patients where the lymph nodes, for example, were removed or MRIs were done where they showed silica within the lymph nodes when the lymph nodes were very prominent on some of the patients that I myself have taken care of where they did a biopsy and they found what was silica-laden uh, macrophages within the lymph nodes. Um, and we know from the imaging studies that show silica. And so we have hard evidence of silica also in the many, many, many pathology specimens of my patients that I've put forth that clearly shows that the silica is leaching into the capsule in the periphery for some patients more, some patients less, but this is starting to and occurs from day one, some more, some less. And after some time, it leaches more and more. Um, so... Uh, Next question is, uh, so you have to take, look how many patients have been to the top 10 hospitals in the country and they themselves overrode their own plastic surgeon or primary care doctors and made that determination that they needed to remove the implant in order to get better and healthy or they had to go remove the residual capsule and this was the own research that they did on their own. Uh, now remember, what I'm doing is, as a board-certified plastic surgeon, I'm removing the implant, I'm removing the capsule, and anything inflamed. So as you will see, uh, fat necrosis, you have patients with fibroadenoma, masses, lymph nodes that are abnormal. Um, anything suspicious, I remove. Even if I'm doing a tummy tuck, for example, I run into a questionable mass, I'm going to remove it, I'm going to send it off. I cannot tell by looking at the mass and see if what it is till the CD30 analysis is done and till the pathologist himself or herself rules out the BILCL CD30 analysis and I spell it out for them, rule out BILCL CD30 analysis and the pathologist here 
that are affiliated with my hospital, they know what to do because that's the whole intended purpose such that the patient has the peace of mind that it is not cancer. Uh, so the goal here is ask your plastic surgeon, what is the goal of the operation? Tell them you don't want to remove the capsule and see what they say. You should see they should have a, a social media presence. They should be actively talking about. There is a patient who went to a plastic surgeon and she removed the implant and attempted removal of the capsule. She f did not even feel comfortable writing down on paper that this is breast implant illness. Yes, it is not an ICD-10 diagnosis, but I myself write down breast implant illness. Uh, essential surgery, non-cosmetic in nature, because if you think about it, this is the most non-cosmetic operation that I'm doing. And the intended purpose is to get the patient healthy and better and be free and void of the many symptoms of what is breast implant illness. Uh, so the next question is from Tracy Gary. She's again a big voice uh, along with Robin, I saw Todd, uh, and uh, others who are truly uh, trying to help a spread awareness. Uh, question is, what can we do with doctors like the former head of the ASPS in Washington State who tells uh, uh, on IG implants are safe and in fact prevent cancer? Now, I will tell you that is uh, wrong information. They do not pre prevent cancer. As I mentioned earlier, how many reports that I have seen the implant obscures a good mammogram read, for example, right? Or if there is a rupture and there's a lot of inflammation, you cannot tell if this is cancer or not. And how many patients don't get a mammogram or a ultrasound simply because they are hurting and they don't feel comfortable getting a mammogram, you know? So a lot of cancer certainly is getting missed. Um, and as is documented, um, you know, by the many uh, mammograms or the patients themselves, they will voice this as well. Uh, unfortunately, the thought here is this, Many of the patients who have implants have, quote, relatively speaking, are more affluent, meaning they're able to get a self-monthly breast exam. Not only that, but they're able to follow up with a doctor or able to get the imaging studies and hence they're able to pick up. That is, uh, the implants only get in the way of what is a good self-monthly breast exam and a mammogram that is going to be not obscured by the implant. So the implants certainly cause a big obstacle into getting a good screening for what is uh, breast cancer. So it is, you know, if you look at the surgeon's demeanor as well, when she was saying it, you know, with all smiling and whatnot else, that tells you a lot for a patient who's listening, that this is not a sound, healthy, credible source or voice. And the patients themselves, unfortunately, in today's world and age, need to educate themselves and make that better decision such that they're able to uh, feel comfortable with their uh, decision about getting the x plan done right. Unfortunately, you're going to find all sorts of uh, doctors with all sorts of thought processes. And unfortunately, if you group together a thousand plastic surgeons, well over 99% of them will truly still negate what is breast implant unless to be a real entity and they will still be augmenting if you just look at the numbers alone across the world. Um, now, the next question as I read is, so you have to choose the right surgeon. Look at the many Facebook lives, and again, I have nothing to gain or Add, this is not my opinion, if you put and look at the FDA evidence, you look at the, the, the manufacturer's warning, you look at the patients and look at the hard data, I'm just analyzing and then seeing the risks of having the implants are certainly uh, a lot worse than having them removed. So another question that I get asked, I'm not hurting, I have my implants that are 10 years old, I feel like I need to get them replaced because this is what the FDA has mentioned. I say, you know, you don't want to find out that you have had a silent rupture and the next thing you know, you're dealing with a ruptured implant with silicon into the lymph nodes and you may have what would be, quote, a perfectly normal exam. And remember, this is vast majority of the implant ruptures are silent ruptures, meaning that you examine the chest, everything looks excellent. It looks like an aesthetically pleasing result. But the next thing you know, 
you do an explant and the next thing you know that it was a ruptured implant to the patient's surprise and to the surgeon's surprise and I've been there too many times unfortunately. So you cannot tell. Now you can get an MRI without contrast to look what is a rupture but as you will see uh, the, the MRI can still be wrong. Um, there was once a day where I did two cases one of the MRIs had said it's a ruptured implant and believe it or not it was not. And the second case, it said it was not ruptured and it was indeed what was a ruptured implant. And not too long ago, two, uh, like almost three weeks ago, I did a case where the MRI said this was a saline implant and indeed it was silicone and it said it was above and it indeed was below. So they were wrong and on the same patient. And I did a Facebook Live uh, that day so you can go back and look. Now, next question is, um, how does Dolly, pa now I will tell you, unfortunately, I do not know, but if you ask deep down within, some patients are hurting and they themselves do not know. Number one, they do not know. I've had patients that came to me and said, well, I'm going to get pregnant. I heard there are a lot of bad things going on with implants. So from my peace of mind, I'm going to go ahead and explain. I don't have any problems. And the next thing you know, that nurse that works at University of Michigan came back and she's like, well, my brain fog is better and my joints are better and I got a lot more energy. And she was in her mid-30s. Now, she could have sworn that she had no problems. And this is where you find out after how you were hurting. Now, remember, there is a period of time where there is no issues going on, be it one decade, be it two decades. Sometimes what you hear in the news or from the media may not be exact reality of what is the patient experiencing. There are times where, you know, one patient came to me and she said to me, I want them out. I said, well, and I always ask this question in my consultation, why do you want them out? And from the way it sounded, she wanted them out a long time ago. She said, and, and, and this is, again, the real life situation that we live in. She said, I always wanted him out. I never put him in. My husband paid for it. Now he has unfortunately passed away. Now I want him out. And I was never too happy with them to begin with from day one. And you will hear the many ladies exactly stating the same where they did not like them from day one or they felt that they would have been better off had they removed them sooner. Now, sometimes for financial reasons, there was another lady that I did a uh, you know, a discussion with, she herself wanted to remove them. But for her husband's sake, she said, I would let them in because I knew he wanted them. Even though she mentally knew that she was better off without them. Now, there are a lot of forces that come into play. If you spend time with me, you'll be surprised. And we did like a Facebook Live there, the significant other has a lot of input and influence as far as explanting. There's another patient, for example, on the phone console list. She said, talk to me privately because I don't want my husband to know that this is what I'm doing and I will eventually do this. Uh, but I don't want there to be a negative friction till I hear exactly what you have to say about me. Now, I say this to you, you know, the patient has to make the decision. This is ultimately her decision. Uh, I say to the patients, I myself look I would love to put in implants, right? But I don't want to hurt no one. And I'll tell you, if you look at the evidence, there is overwhelming evidence and what I will see, a no-brainer. And there is not only physical, but mental, financial. And look uh, how the implants ultimately will only hurt the body, some sooner, some later. And who knows, uh, Miss uh, you know, Dolly uh, Patton or anyone else might be hurting and you may not know the reality of it. Uh, now, next question. Um, so choosing a surgeon is indeed what is a very important aspect of doing it right and doing it right the first time um, and, uh, and not having to second guess and seeing where you're going to go uh, for your potential, uh, you know, uh, residual capsule removal. Uh, now, uh, again, Tracy Gary mentions interesting info about the incision. That's certainly very true. Um, now, this is, let me go ahead and explain this in a little bit more detail. If you look at the vast majority of the ladies, they have their incision. And I want you to look at the operative note. This is how we as board certified plastic surgeons were taught. And I find this is important. Uh, 
I'm going to go ahead and pull up on my other phone what is the pectoralis major muscle, which is the muscle that is sitting on the chest. And this is uh, where, as you will see, you have the muscle insertion on the humerus. Let me go ahead and find out a better picture right here. So if you see the insertion in blue is in the upper arm humerus and the origin is here in the midline which is the sternal area. You don't want to touch this if you're a surgeon putting implants. You certainly don't want to touch this. And as you will see the surgeon comes in and when they want to put the implant below the muscle they make a cut on the lower outer part without touching the origin so now you lift up the muscle and then you put in the implant underneath this muscle so very important the surgeon goes in and makes a cut here and all the way to this you don't want to go into the origin part and then you lift the lateral part of the muscle up and then you put in the 350, 300, 250, 400cc implant. Now the muscle is so tightly adherent to the rib underneath where this is the pec major and you have the pec minor underneath. So the implant goes underneath the pec major. Now once the implant goes underneath the pec major, you cannot close the muscle down and cover the implant completely. So what happens is, if you will, if you can imagine, the muscle is on the chest like so, and then the implant is put underneath. So part of the implant is sticking out, right? So it's covering and it's essentially like this. If my hand is the pectoralis major muscle and the implant is put underneath, so it works as a internal bra, if you will. Now, as soon as I make cut horizontal, guess what I'm going to be running into? I'm going to be running into this implant right here, right? And so now guess what happens over time? If I contract the muscle, meaning to tighten my arm, the muscle contracts and guess what? It pushes the implant down and out even more. So it basically, the implant wants to go down and out. And so this is the path of least resistance. So any good reputable board certified plastic surgeon would put usually a mesh or a sutures that's going to retain now that's not a good idea at all. Now there is mention and talk about many plastic surgeons not compromising the muscle because every time you move the muscle or lift something heavy, guess what? The implant is being pushed down and the muscle contracts and is out. So when I make the horizontal cut, I'm always dissecting directly into what I see is the implant. And then I write the capsule and this is the trick. You write the capsule so there is no nerves, no ducts, nothing. And I'm always underneath the muscle going horizontal if this is the muscle i'm going always horizontal underneath the muscle directly on top of the implant such that i'm able to tease the implant out on top of the rib directly underneath the muscle the breast tissue is above so i don't touch that that's why i'm able to get away with having operated on a lot of patients who are actively nursing for example and this is what allows me to be able to dissect the capsule definitively off of the rib. Now imagine if I make an up and down cut, you're cutting through that muscle too, right? Now the muscle sometimes window shades up. Now what happens in the many patients who have breast cancer, so this is very important. In the many patients who have breast cancer, the surgeon goes in, makes a cut right in the center, puts in a tissue expander, and then closes the muscle and in that tissue expander they put in 50, 70, 90 cc's no more because then they cannot close the muscle and then the patient goes into their plastic surgeon's office every month and they put in through that special uh, uh, magnet and they insert like 50, 70, 90, 150 cc's till the muscle expands and the tissue expander expands and it's not the skin that's the limiting part it's actually the muscle then a month later, the patient comes back in and then other 60, 80, 100, 150 cc's depending on how the tissue expander expands. And now the patient feels comfortable after three, four, five, 
uh, serial expansions and once it equilibrates the surgeon then goes in cuts that muscle removes the tissue expander and then puts in the silicone most of the time because it's insurance covered or sealing implant and then suture close the muscle and so this is where those patients with breast cancer are able to get a serial dilatation dilation of that muscle in the cosmetic patients literally in an hour that muscle is cut lifted up the muscle is cut, lifted up, and the implant is placed, which inevitably drains down and out. And so this is where the horizontal cut allows for the surgeon to dissect nicely and completely and definitively. Now, it's a little bit more involved because I'm bending my head and I'm dissecting in what is an angle, right? And certainly that is a hard part where some of the uh, surgeons have even mentioned I like to do an up and down because it's easier for my neck and back and I'm able to dissect down which is the easier exposure. No, it's not. Uh, because how can you dissect from up and down incision and be able to go uh, basically horizontal on top of the rib? The majority of them are committing to just an up and down incision. So this is my take on it because I see the patients who have gone and unfortunately, in the three, four hours, the commitment was done to a lift and fat grafting or just a lift where the entire expand that is below the muscle, there was minimal effort and just cauterization that was done in incomplete uh, explantation because the residual capsule certainly remains behind. Um, so how many flat closures have I done um, now? Uh, now, flat, remember, almost 15% of my practice. Now, what's interesting is the patients come in waves. Um, I have done a lot of flat closures, uh, a good number of flat closures uh, where the patient received chemo, a uh, few number of uh, basically percentage-wise as far as patients that come in with radiation to the chest. Now, these are patients who are very complex because once you radiate the chest, there are a lot of setbacks as far as nerve, there is a burn to the chest, the blood vessels, the skin becomes leathery, and just the fact that surgery is done, uh, the chances of someone running into problems becomes high. Thank God to date, I have not had a single infection per se where I have had to go back or admit for IV antibiotics. The, the Cosmetic patients by far are much more than what are the breast cancer patients. And I do absolutely a fair number of breast cancer patients, especially on the Wednesdays where the dissection uh, is done uh, underneath the muscle and where alloderm is used. Alloderm is the cadaveric skin and well over half of my cancer patients who have had alloderm reconstruction, which is cadaveric skin. And I will show you which is the lower inferior part of the reconstruction is using alloderm and the superior part is the muscle. Now, once the alloderm is removed, which needs to be removed absolutely and sent to pathology along with the capsule and implant, and this is where Eclipse and Ethibon suture is also removed, anything foreign is removed. And not only have I done patients with flat chest, but patients who have had the deep, the deep inferior epigastric perforator flap closures, patients who have had latissimus dorsi flap or the tran flap, for example, closure. These are certainly cases that add on to the complexity of patients who have had mastectomy closure. So these are very complex and very time consuming and tedious uh, procedures. And uh, they certainly are a good, I use the word, uh, challenge for the plastic surgeon who's explanting. And certainly uh, they are very, I use the word, uh, involved, but very um, uh, straightforward to do uh, in uh, my hands. And I feel comfortable doing those, absolutely. Uh, now, next question is... Uh, So aesthetic society is telling surgeons not to remove capsules. I'll tell you, you know, the number of BIALCL cases is underreported. This is what the society has acknowledged. 
there are so many patients who are telling you directly, don't listen to me, listen to the patients where the capsules were left behind and the breast implant illness symptoms continued. I tell the patients, you listen to what I have to say, the FDA has to say, the manufacturers have to say, and the patients are saying, and then you make a rational decision on your own. Remember, my job is not to convince you. My job is to relate to you what I see. If I'm a patient and I'm told that I may get cancer, I may potentially die from lymphoma and that there is illness that may result as a result of an implant and that the, the, they're not meant to be in the body forever and that every 10, 15 years, I, I will dare not even think about that procedure, right? Uh, now, I will never know what it is like to have an, uh, uh, an implant, but I will tell you I've seen enough and all what needs to do is just look at the many ladies and type in before, after explant videos and pictures and you will see just from the pictures alone how the many hundreds of thousands if not over the years, the, the, the many patients who have explanted and who have only reclaimed and gotten their life and health back. So I see in some of the groups I've seen women have said they don't follow the after surgery protocol. A few of them could not stand the binder. Now I will say this to you. Um, the, this is true for any plastic surgery procedure where you get a gynecomastia surgery, the male breast surgery, where the gland is removed and the fat is removed. You have to wear a vest for six weeks. You do a thigh lift, you have to wear a garment. You do a tummy tuck, you have to wear a garment for six weeks, eight weeks. So in a similar way, using the same principles of this dead space where the implant was and the inflammation was. Remember, if someone gets a tummy tuck, that area that where the surgery was done was healthy and nice and viable and good tissue. Where the implants were, these were inflamed, angry, irritated, inflamed with engorged swelling, lymph nodes swollen, sometimes fluid, what not else. If there is a rupture, you can see the silicon mastitis inflammation. So these are not healthy tissues. You have to have not only the bra, but also the binder reinforcement for the same reason. It helps with the recoil, it helps with the pushed up, uh, you know, uh, what I would say, pain control to an extent. If you fall off a bike and you get a bad road rash, you put an ace wrap on, you actually feel good. Similarly, uh, after a surgery like this, the brine binder certainly helps and overall helps with the overall aesthetic recovery. And you can certainly put garments and our fluffy dressings that will help with uh, basically uh, the binder and it is certainly very doable, manageable. Some patients are not able to tolerate it, uh, but as you will see a good number, many of the patients are actually very happy and feel good with the binder. Um, and unfortunately the binder gets a bad name. Now I'll tell you the binder is what is a necessary evil, but it really, really helps as a reminder for the patients to be in the T-Rex arm phase. And remember, the muscle inserts into the upper arm and you want to be very limited as far as your movement. You don't want to be lifting your arm or lifting anything heavy because inevitably then you're going to be moving that muscle around which, under which, or above which where the implant was. Now, how many explants do I do a week? So on Tuesday, I do three. Wednesday, I do uh, two or three. I, and I usually do the cancer patients and on Thursday I do two or three. Now there are times where, um, you know, I have done surgery, for example, last week on a Monday, a patient that came to me from um, out of state um, and she actually came from California and she had history of seizures. So I did her case on last Monday, a week ago. That was a week before Memorial Day. And so she... I uh, had uh, like almost uh, 30 uh, seizures a uh, couple months prior, so I didn't want to do her. And sometimes I've operated on, uh, uh, you know, basically a Thursday to follow, for example, in some of those, uh, you know, add-on cases. But I never operate on Fridays. Fridays I find people, uh, the, 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 sometimes, uh, you know, the team is not completely there. Some people take Fridays off. Um, and some patients, uh, I will tell you, I myself feel uncomfortable uh, operating on Fridays at the hospital because of this quote Friday checkout phenomenon after noon. I think some people don't give it their 110%. And humbly, this is my experience. 
Uh, I don't want to be going to the operating room on a Friday afternoon. Uh, you know, that's not a healthy time when everyone's kind of worrying more about what they're going to do on the weekend and they're not giving 110%. Um, now, do you believe some people reject the implants? Now, absolutely. Some people reject more than the others. Some people are able to live with the implants for 20 years, 25, 30 years. Again, we do not know. Some people, uh, now remember, if someone has implants and the FDA is telling you they're not meant to be in the body forever, and remember the manufacturers themselves are telling you they're not meant to be in the body forever. Forget the FDA. You do not know if you're going to be at the 10-year mark, 12-year mark, 15-year mark, and they're telling you that you could succumb to it even at the seven-year mark. And don't listen to me, listen to the many patients, right? I did a case uh, where almost six years into her silicon uh, augmentation, she had a rupture, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is we do not know, and they're telling you 10 to 15 years, that's the FDA and the manufacturer, so there is no healthy time. After that, you're kind of playing, I don't want to use the word Russian roulette, but it could happen next month, it could happen next year, it could happen 10 years later, but it will happen. And no one can tell. That's why they say the MRI, a good self-monthly breast exam. And you cannot say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You could have a rupture, a silent rupture, and your exam may be pristine uh, and very unremarkable, and you could very well be with ruptured implants. And what's ironic and interesting is the manufacturers themselves say the biologic or the clinical implications behind a rupture is not well known. I'll tell you this, you tell anyone that you have a rupture of a silicon implant that is not known, of course it is unhealthy. That's why they're telling you to get a MRI at year three and every two years they're onward so that if they're ruptured that you get quote, them out, right? They're not just doing it for the fun of it. And so there, the implications are certainly very there. So they're saying at one Maybe we do not know what the clinical effect is, but get an MRI at year three and every two years they're onward. These are two contradictory statements. Uh, next question is, uh, uh, so this is a good point. Um, I hear fat transfer is not good. It was done. I am six, uh, Hours post need lumps of fat. Now you have to let things settle. Uh, now remember, majority of the times the implant is below the muscle. I don't necessarily go. And remember, when they do fat, uh, uh, the fat transfers, they splay what they do, the fanning technique. So it's like a, a Chinese fan, right? They, they spread it out in the top, intermediate, lower. And the goal here is when they spread the fat out, they spread it out such that each one of those moves that they do, they deposit the fat in a new layer where the blood supply will co nourish the fatty tissue that has been transferred and hopefully allow it for it to live. Now remember the breast tissue in itself is inflamed, there is mastitis, irritation, dilated veins, and it's not a uh, conducive environment for the fat to take compared to let's say the face for example where 30% of the fat, even in the best of the hands, by the Coleman Technique dyes, as I mentioned earlier. So, uh, you know, I will tell you, the, the biggest dreaded complication from this surgery is, now first thing I just, and I'll be blunt, no one dies from this surgery. This is outpatient surgery. The biggest complication that I find is when the patients themselves are non-compliant. And this is unfortunately the reality. I have had now a total of six hematomas. The first one was within the first 24 hours. And I take complete what is technical fault, whatever it may be, and it happens. And this was very early on, almost four years ago or so. The other five hematomas that have occurred were day 9, day 11, day 14, day 18, and day 19, where the patients themselves felt comfortable, they had more energy, they were not wearing the binder, and they were moving their arms around. The last one just happened not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before. And again, God bless this nice lady. She's a mom of five kids. 
She's young, energetic, healthy, very vibrant lady, very youthful, very good. Um, and God bless her soul, she told me at 8 p.m. California time, 11 p.m. my time on a Saturday, she noticed all of a sudden one of the sides automatically filled up. And this is where that muscle tear occurred. And guess what? A plastic surgeon in the Los Angeles. Now she, she called me and she said that, you know, this is what's going on. And I said, when did it happen? She said, it happened very fast. And I said, you know what? This is a hematoma. I said, how painful is it? I said, maybe it just like you fall on ice and you find like your face is bruised, right? It's twice the size and it comes down. I said, let's sit tight. If it gets worse, you yourself will know that it's time to make the next move. And she texted me and she said, you know what, I'm going in. I said, go to the emergency room. You get seen by a general surgeon or a plastic surgeon. You go to a big center, you get seen by a plastic surgeon. She got seen by a plastic surgeon. He made a cut, removed the hematoma, and he found indeed what was muscle that was bleeding. And he took care of that problem and problem solved. Now, obviously, it was a big inconvenience. I wish that had never happened. And the patient herself, with all humbleness knew what was the cause and effect had she not moved she would not have had now this is unfortunately the nature of the surgery where i say to the patients the t-rex arms is very important the brine binder is key now remember out of a thousand patients if i have six patients this is i'm very humble to say a very nice result especially when there was one technical issue and there was uh, you know, the others that I mentioned, the five that were had a hematoma on their own because of over excessive movement. Another lady was a nurse. She went to the farmer's market, lifted something heavy with both her hands. And of course, you're going to use the pec muscle and inevitably that's going to lead another lady stretched early in the morning on a Thursday uh, after she had been seen uh, by me in clinic, you know. And so this is after the first post-op visit. And if you do, you certainly you're going to find there is no other way where the muscle is not going to contract and cause this to happen. So again, compliance is key. And if you listen, tell yourself this is uh, not, you know, again, the six weeks go by very fast. We want the healing to occur. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer like three more questions. Um, and hopefully you found this all informative. Now, I find this is very, I use the word brave, lack of a better word, by some Facebook owners who are not even doctors, not even nurses, who are not even clinicians, who have never stepped into the operating room, who themselves step up and become the guiding light for the many who have heard of breast implant illness. And because they were instrumental into gathering patients and somehow being now the authoritative board as to what is the American Board of Explant Surgery, you know, and I say this sarcastically, you know, it is very brave and if you ask me naive and foolish for someone to make a decision and to be able to highlight another plastic surgeon who basically donated a little bit of money. So you want to be careful. Look, I talked to that patient from Hawaii last night and she said there is two Hawaii patients who there are two Hawaii plastic surgeons on this list that she has. And I said, who's making the decision about who these two other docs are? And God bless their soul, I do not know who they are. But how can someone be sitting somewhere and have no concept of what a bovi cautery is and how it works and she has never or he has never operated? And how can they make a determination about how safe or how effective or how good an explant surgeon this one is? Uh, you know, and it is wrong. And, you know, I hope that, you know, the Starks law violation states that for a financial gain that you incentivize and promote someone, it is illegal and wrong and unprofessional and unethical. Uh, and there's hopefully there will be consequences for someone misguiding and misleading in the name of money. And so I ask the patients themselves to make the decision on their own. And they should be able to network and be resourceful. The only best credible resource, if I was the patient, is to look at the surgeon's old patients and make a determination as to why this surgeon is better and what is the goal and commitment of that surgeon. And I have nothing I will tell you to gain other than the patient's own interest. I have been 
said unfortunately patients say well he's uh you know i will tell you financially i'll be a whole lot better off not only financially in the one hour it takes to augment and the four hours you can do the math and plus not only physically it's very easy to put an implants on a virgin young healthy chest or even a redo versus removing implants off of the capsule off of the rib which is indeed what is the most involved the hardest part of the operation and from a liability perspective it's certainly a lot harder to be removing implants in the manner and in the definitive way shape and form versus putting in implants and last but not least most of these patients who have had these augmentations if someone has a small chest and she got 550 cc implants, you can imagine that the surgeon dissected much inferiorly. Now, when I removed the implant, the patient has a scar tissue that's at the bottom because the previous surgeon uh, made the dissection where the inframemory crease was violated. And now there is a lot bigger scar because he made an unprofessional decision and he should have guided the patient to choose smaller implants because you only allowed certain size because of the chest width that ultimately determines the size of the implant. And so those patients that have had 600 cc's on a patient that is five feet two, you can only imagine where and how the surgeon made the cut above and down and laterally where there was a lot of compromise in the muscle and how the dissection was done violating the inframemory crease. So all of those uh, patients that have been Disserviced, I have to unfortunately do the best I can such that I can salvage it such that the patient gets hopefully one good aesthetic operation. At the same time, I'm explanting such that they don't have to undergo a second surgery. Now, I will tell you, can you help someone get it, getting interested in doing research? Now, a big part of research is you cannot just put a case study and one or two and three and publish and say that's my take that's like a joke someone writes it over like a lunch break uh, that is a case study right in order to do a true study for example the thousand patients that i presented at the dubai conference i have to have an irb where you have a review board that looks at these patients and then you have to have a very objective independent analysis where you have a dedicated team that looks at, let's say, for example, that 55 questionnaire symptoms of breast implant illness. And then a year later, you reach the same patients without any financial incentive or any commitment and then have them weigh in and see how their symptoms are in order to truly gauge and then to be able to show that this indeed helped the many patients. Now we have what are anecdotal uh, evidence of what is uh, basically uh, the benefits of explantation, right? There is nothing definitive, conclusive, and predictable. The best is that you do a prospective randomized control study where you po follow the patients from the time they come in to the time they explant and then see their journeys as to how they have improved. And nowadays you can only talk to the patient. They have nothing to gain or lose and you can see how their before and after pictures, the swelling on the face, the joint pain, the neck and back problems, the vision, uh, you know, the dryness of the eyes, all of that has only improved and with what is uh, resolution of the many breast implant illness symptoms. I'm going to go ahead and look at one more question and then I will get done. Um, you know, there is mention, and again, uh, you see the many uh, celebrities. Um, you know, there is uh, Miss Dion, Celine Dion. You know, again, I do not know. Uh, I, you know, God bless her soul. Hopefully she feels better and healthy and has a long, prosperous life. You know, there are many patients that we do not know as to what the illness is, what underlying problems they have, and God bless them. Again, these are patients that we can discuss because we know of them. You know, look at uh, that nice uh, race car driver. 
you know, she, God bless her soul, she came forth and she discussed her journey. And that certainly has raised a lot of awareness. And that is, you know, if you can get, you know, and, and again, if I may mention, uh, there is no uh, basically HIPAA violation here. Like Angelina Jolie, she has had the BRCA gene, God bless her soul, for sharing her journey where the BRCA gene, if one has, what is the recommendation? Now, she has implants. Now, if you can only imagine one day, I hope she lives happily ever after, but one day, her implants, her time will come, be it next year, 10 years later, 20 years later, whatever time. Remember, the implants are not meant to be in the body forever, 10 to 15 years. Don't quote me. These are the words of the FDA and the manufacturers. So if she explants and she has these symptoms, God knows how she's going to improve and you can only raise so much awareness by a celebrity. And I'll tell you, any of my patients are as much as a celebrity as celebrity can be and we all are equal and there is no, but it's the awareness that they raise, like Danica Kirkpatrick, for example, how much good she has brought forth by genuinely sharing her journey. And she, I have had so many patients just walk in and said, I have the same same problem that Danica had, for example, and that is a big plus. And this is, you know, the awareness that we need. And once just look at the many celebrities who have come forth and shared their journey, and we thank them for sharing their journey because they're doing it in the middle of their career and certainly raising awareness uh, what is uh, not what would be what one would expect, especially when they are uh, you know looked at very carefully between the camera and pictures and the videos uh, that they put forth. Uh, one more question. Uh, So I got this question asked, you know, I'm coming from out of state, um, uh, and uh, uh, how uh, wise is it for me to come from out of state and get the surgery done in Michigan? I'm in California. You know, the patient last night, let me use her if she's in Hawaii, uh, you know, all, and she has Los Angeles right in the middle. And you have a good, reputable, at least 1,000 plastic surgeons between San Francisco and San Diego. She did her homework and I told her that two-thirds of my patients come from out of uh, uh, the state, out of town, uh, you know, be it the neighboring states. I did a phone consult, as you saw, uh, from Japan uh, three weeks ago. Uh, last night it was Hawaii. I have another California patient that I couldn't talk to last night because it got pretty late. The vast majority of the patients, I tell them, you talk to me, do a phone consult, and then you come in and see me physically on a Monday. Once you've seen me on Monday, I get to examine you. You get to see me the facility. Your sixth sense, you got instant. You don't want to see your surgeon the morning off. Tuesday, the surgery happens. You re remember a lot of information is determined that Tuesday. Wednesday, you recover. Thursday, you recover. Friday, I see you early in clinic. When you see me in clinic, I then give you the green light. Except for one patient, I have had all my patients go back to their respective states. There were three other patients who said, well, I want to stay there till Monday because I have my own jet, one of the patients said. Another patient said, well, I just feel comfortable. I have the the weekend off or I have family here. Uh, you know, I'm from out of town, but I have my family here. So they decided to, that they were gonna stay here till that Monday, a week after. But vast majority of my patients go back on that Friday after I've seen them in clinic. There was only one patient that came to me from California. She was in her mid fifties and she was on prednisone and she had 800 cc implant and she was a cancer patient and they were videotaping her. So for that reason, I wanted her to stay here over the weekend. And she still was able to go back on Monday. And the point here is I can safely, wisely, definitively manage the patients from the comfort of their home once they have been seen by me at my uh, post-op 
uh, clinic, which is usually that Friday. And if I do operate on the Thursday, I see my patients on a uh, Thursday, uh, the Thursday patients on a Monday. So that is after the weekend, they stay an extra day, for example. And so, um, for example, today, because it was a Memorial Weekend yesterday, I saw my Thursday California patient today. And when, and she was a special patient. She was on prednisone. She had hydratinitis, which is a bacterial slash skin condition on the armpits and underneath the breast and the groin that she had. And I want to do, see her day five. But the vast majority of the patients are able to go back and remember they're not having the drains and I feel very comfortable. Because remember, a lot is determined on the day of surgery. Even with the many ruptured patients, I'm able to basically do the surgeries without the need for the drains. And again, the track record speaks for itself. And even some patients that live, believe it or not, 45 minutes, Rochester Hills, for example, an hour away, an hour, 15 minutes, they choose not to come to me because I can manage them in a similar fashion that I manage my out-of-town patients. And then I continue to follow them. And if there is any issues, any uh, I deal directly with them very closely, very definitively, and I'm able to work with them such that they're able to recover optimally and very safely. And I myself make the phone calls. I myself follow up, not my nurse practitioner or a nurse I myself uh, talk to them because only I know what happened in the OR and I only know what is going to be the expected outcome for the, the many patients. And this allows for me to basically deal with my patients directly that I all know very well. Um, and uh, the limiting factor is I myself look today, I got a text from Jennifer and she said one of the patients got tired of waiting for a phone consult and she's going elsewhere. And I said, you know what? I'm going at the max capacity that I can. Last night, it was an hour and 11 minute discussion I had with the Hawaii patient. I did not want to rush her. I wanted her to ask me all the questions. Today on the way back, I have my follow-up patients from out of town that I'm going to talk to. And so the point I'm trying to make here is my limiting factor is my time and I want to make sure that I deliver the quality care and I'm able to definit, uh, completely and definitively answer the questions and move on to the next. I'm not the type of person that's advertising heavily and then filling up to like one year out, six months out and saying and bragging about it. On the contrary, I'm very happy and content with where I am. And always at any given time, I'm the one who's playing catch up. So having said this, uh, please ask your questions. Please be professional and assertive and talk, uh, I suggest that you basically dissect through and hear and know a lot about your surgeon before you even talk. And this is the take home message. Your surgeon must be committed, definitively 100% convinced that the capsule must be removed. And if the capsule is not removed, you will be continuing to hurt and that capsule must be checked. Not only the capsule must be checked for lymphoma, or any problems, but the cultures be done, implants be returned, and your surgeon's whole focus should be on that capsule and inflamed tissue that's in the periphery, along with the implant removed in the manner we discussed, such that you have the peace of mind and the freedom from the implants, and the complete confidence and no anxiety and the peace of mind that you got the best surgery that you deserve. Having said this, thank you very much everyone for joining. Um, and I wish you the absolute very best. Good luck researching. And till we meet again, have a wonderful uh, early start of the summer. Take care. Bye-bye.